Hello, and thank you all very much for uh, spending the time here with me today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this talk. I'm very much going to present this as uh, my thoughts and ideas that, that I'm presenting really to encourage discussion and more thoughts. So it's all going to be focusing on how we can support student success in a skill-based world. And again, I'm going to throw out there my notions about what would be the optimal ed tech ecosystem that links institutions with vendors um, with the goal of maximizing student success. And I'll define these things along the way, but that's, that's the general view. Uh, and I really hope to hear from you at the end of this webinar about your thoughts and your ideas. So as I'm talking, you know, feel free to, to put things on the chat window. I may not answer them right away or I may, uh, but at least then we'll, uh, we'll be able to come back to them at the end of the talk uh, or take various notes to ask during the QA session. I'm gonna, my goal is to chat for about 45 minutes and then to have at least 15 minutes uh, available for Q&A uh, with all of you. So fantastic, let's, let's jump right in. So before we jump right in, um, this is of course uh, sponsored by Campus Consortium. Um, these are the details, but you're all here, so you don't really need the details. But I do want to thank uh, John Wanamaker for, uh, for well, for first of all agreeing to allow me to give this webinar. Thank you, John. Uh, but for also all the support he provided as I prepared this um, and with the goal of making it something that all of you will find relevant, interesting, provocative, etc. Um, that's what we're trying to pull off today. Um, just. Campus Consortium has been generous enough to allow me to uh, speak to you today, so I just want to you know highlight that they are a leading nonprofit educational institution um, with thousands of higher education institutions and K to twelve school district members. I want to highlight this next part: the Campus Consortium mission is to help members reduce the time, cost, and effort associated with implementing enterprise IT services by leveraging shared IT services, lessons learned, and best practices so that each member can avoid reinventing the wheel, reinventing the wheel when adopting new educational technologies. This spirit will be echoed um, in my talk. Uh, there's a lot of what's said right there to help members reduce time, cost, and effort associated with implementing enterprise IT services. Very much this will be the spirit of, of what I'm going to talk to you about today, how we can more efficiently use ed tech to enhance student success. So very cool. I'm very happy to be working with them. Um, thank you guys and thank you for all you do. Uh, here are some of the sponsors of Campus Consortium. Uh, Oracle, Black Belt Help, Quick Launch SSO, Salesforce, Cisco, Oculus IT, and Unified. Um, so thank all of you for supporting all of us as we try to support student success. All right, so on to the talk proper. Um, there's really four sections to this talk and most of it will be on the last section, but to really set things up, uh, first of all, I need to tell you a little bit about who I am uh, and the perspectives I bring to this issue. Uh, secondly, I wanna focus on the current educational context, at least as I see it, and that's why I wanna focus on it because some of us see you know, the current challenges and things a little differently, so I wanna be very clear about what my perspective is on what we mean by student success in the current world and what role ed tech can play in helping us achieve that. Um, to aid this discussion a little bit more, I'm gonna follow that with a concrete example and it's an ed tech that I'm involved with called Peer Scholar. And I just wanna use it so that we're not just talking about these abstract kind of ideas but we have something very clear and concrete to think about, um, both in terms of the tech itself what it does um, and how it answers some of these challenges, but also from the perspective of the ed tech vendor, what the challenges are involved with, with getting the tech out there, getting it used. All right, so, so this is sort of my uh, launch pad for a lot of the thoughts, and that's what we will then focus on, um, the thoughts I've had uh, on how we could maybe restructure our ecosystem. In some cases, some of you may already be here, um, but in some cases not. So I'm going to talk about how we can work better with vendors. Institutions and vendors, I think, need to need to connect better and, and respect each other more and work together better. So I'll talk about that a little bit. I'll talk about why I think it's critical to centralize procurement, why I think it's critical that we really come up with a rational basis for our ed tech procurement, and, and by that I will mean one focused on pedagogy. I will talk about how we can then structure a deal with ed tech companies that will um, create a sort of partnership 
between the institution and the vendor where both are working hard together to enhance success. And so that will begin with the deal, but I'll talk about some other issues that can feed that partnership. Okay, so that's where we're going. Let's, let's start going. Each of these sections all have a little thing like this. Who am I? To remind us where we are along the way. We are at the who am I section. All right, who am I anyway? Okay, my name is Steve Jordans. Um, as, as you know from the ad that went around, um, there's really four perspectives I bring to these issues today. The first is as a consumer of educational technologies. I, I teach a very large, yes, that's not a misprint, 1700 student introduction to psychology class uh, at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Um, I very much dislike the notion that a large class suggests a, a shallow learning experience and in fact most of my career is an attempt to disprove that. Uh, so in my class I use seven different educational technologies and that's not including the uh, learning management system to try to deepen the learning that students engage in. Three of these those technologies are homegrown. I'll come to that point uh, in just a moment. Uh, and I have been very fortunate to, to win some uh, awards and such, including the 3M National Teaching Fellowship in Canada, which is, which is an award that recognizes, it's their highest national award that recognizes a, a sustained and significant contribution to higher ed in, in Canada. So that's, that's very cool. Um, in addition to my teaching, I'm also the director of the Advanced Technolo Learning Technologies Lab at U of T Scarborough. Um, we... I started, by the way, as a cognitive psychologist, um, studying a lot of uh, human memory and, and human consciousness stuff, which was very cool, but I really love teaching. And eventually, again, with this challenge of how can we teach well in very large classes, I started um, being focused on the role technology can play there. And so in our lab, we do create some technologies, hence the three homegrown ones. Um, but we also assess technologies, ours and others, um, primarily for these two attributes, for their efficacy and for their usability. As I'll kind of be highlighting throughout some of the point today, these are almost two equally important aspects. One would think efficacy would be more important, um, but a major challenge many universities face is getting professors to use good technologies. Uh, and so usability is as important to scaling as efficacy is. Uh, and the best technologies are, are, you know, do well in both counts. Uh, and so we have sometimes very empirical ways of, of assessing control group design kinds of things to, to really put technologies through their paces. So that's one of the other things I do. Um, okay, so I'm also, from a university perspective, and it might be these last two um, aspects that are actually most relevant um, to the discussion today. I do sit on the university side when we think about at University of Toronto and at University of Toronto Scarborough, how we think about you know, how we're going to procure ed tech, um, how we're going to support its use on campus, how we're going to spread its use on campus. Um, so for example, I've, I was just most recently on a committee called the Transformative Teaching and Learning Committee, where we really focused on you know, a number of issues about upping our, our teaching game, essentially. Um, and, but one of them was, of course, the role that ed tech plays. So, so I've lived on the university side of that. Now I also live on the vendor side of that. One of our homegrown technologies is called Peer Scholar. Uh, we have a startup called Cognito, and I am the chief science officer of Cognito, which, which means I you know, oversee a lot of the research and such we do with it. Um, but also I, in, in all honesty, am the primary sales person for, for Peer Scholar at this time, which means I am often the one making contact with institutions uh, essentially trying to convince them that Peer Scholar is a tool they should, they should include in their tool belt. Uh, and so that's where a lot of, you know, the interplay of these last two is where a lot of the points in the current talk is going to come from. Okay? All right. So now let's talk about the current educational context, at least how I see it. We'll see if, if, if you agree to a large extent. We have a nice little infographic here. I've got a link at the bottom, um, just kind of showing the role that um, uh, you know, technology has played at different points, uh, different decades of education. I'm really gonna focus on, on the end here, on the right side, where the focus is on 21st century skills uh, and college, and I would say college and career readiness, right? We're trying to prepare our students for success, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I want to highlight, and I will throughout this talk, that word skills. 
because it's a deceptively simple looking word, but when you bring it into the higher education context, it in fact implies a, a real change in how we educate. Uh, and that's what makes it such a challenge. Um, we also, if, if we're over here, we see multifunctional devices, personalization, tech as an integrated tool. Um, so the idea here being that you know, the students are going to have the tech with them all the time. The university has to have the seamlessly integrated um, and tech can do things like personalized learning and, and, and other things. So yeah, we are here um, and, and we're in this world where it's all about this connection between uh, technology, education through technology, and the notion of using that technology to develop skills in our students. All right. A little bit more word on the skills and why they're as important as they are. They've of course always been important and, and we've always kind of taught them, but I would argue we've taught them in an informal way. Um, we've hoped that our lectures and our textbook readings and the assignments we give students would encourage them to think critically, think creatively, communicate their ideas with each other. And I think in the past we've allowed that to happen a little spontaneously, not in a real structured formal way. And I think now we're being pushed to do that. And there's some reasons we're being pushed to do that. You know, so first of all, just to be a little more clear on the skills, we're talking things like you see here. The cognitive skills are like critical thinking, creative thinking. Intrapersonal skills are things like emotional intelligence, ability to know, understand, and manage one's own emotions and learning. So sort of metacognitive, you know, know yourself stuff. And of course, the interpersonal skills, which all involves being able to work with others. So having good communication skills, which means both expressing yourself well, but also listening to others and being able to do that in both individual settings and group settings, because a lot happens in group settings. These are the kinds of skills we're talking about. OK, high level so-called transferable skills. And the argument is that they are more important now than they ever have been. And that argument is based on a number of things. Um, here's uh, just, just a couple statistics that, that I'll throw out there. Um, happy to give the references for any of these uh, if you'd like. But 42% of jobs, they say, are at high risk of being affected by automation within the next decade or two. And that's just sort of the automation of old jobs. There's also, of course, innovation, which is, which is creating brand new jobs that never existed before. Uh, and so the, the important point of that is that it's very hard for us to know today as educators what the jobs will even be five years from now. The, the, the work climate is constantly evolving and changing. Um, and so we can't really or we shouldn't really teach students the skill or, or, or the information, let's say, that they need to do a very specific job. Rather, the claim is if we teach them these transferable skills, then whatever the job market is, they can adapt to it. These skills will allow them to succeed in almost any context. They transfer from context to context, um, which is also important because a lot of data shows that the students themselves transfer from context to context, that most graduates will work in a number of different work contexts before settling into a long-term career if they ever do. So some students literally move from very different career contexts uh, from one to the next and, and do so throughout much of their life. Uh, and so again, the idea here is if they're great critical thinkers and great communicators and they know their own strengths and weaknesses, etc., they can do that. They can succeed in all these contexts. And so that you know is the premium now, creating students, creating students, um, <laughs> helping our students develop these skills that would allow them to succeed across a wide range of contexts. Now, I said skills is a little word, but it's a big word in another way, and it really is. So let me go back to my cognitive psychology training for a moment here. And yes, that's the Toronto Raptors world champions. Woohoo! Kyle Lowry, where you going? Anyway, uh, let me come, come back to that uh, cognitive psychology and just for a moment draw a very important distinction for education. We talk about memory like it's a single thing, but it's not. We have many different memory systems that, and, and they work differently, they learn differently, and they show themselves differently. Mostly when we say the word memory, we're, we're thinking about memory for information. So our, our ability to recall information or events. What did you have for supper last night? Um, when, when you recall that, you probably replay the whole 
event. That's what we call an episodic memory. Uh, what's seven times six? If you knew that, 42, you probably got that information, but you didn't remember the whole context. We call that semantic memory, all the, all the information we've learned about the world um, through our lifetime. Uh, so those sorts of, I'm just going to lump those together and call those information, this memory for information. And the important thing about that is you can learn information with a single exposure. So imagine a, an excellent lecture or a really well-written textbook can, can uh, present some piece of information to students in a way that they will never subsequently forget it. Um, and uh, you know that's, that's extremely powerful. It's also extremely efficient. Uh, if you have repeated exposure to that information, that's optimal. You know, that gives you an even better memory for the information. I will argue to you today that our traditional approaches in higher education have really had a strong focus on this, on memory for information, um, and that we're very good at doing this, uh, and that it's an important thing to do. You know, I don't want to downplay that information isn't relevant. It is, it is relevant. But again, as indicated by the previous stuff, skills are perhaps even more important in the modern world. And the thing is, we learn skills very differently. If you want to play basketball like Kyle Lowry, good luck. <laughs> if you want to come even close, you better get to work. Uh, because in order to, to do the sorts of things um, that an athlete like this does, you, your body has to learn to automate a bunch of processes, to combine them together in very efficient ways. That's what skills are. Think of playing guitar or anything like that. It's all these behaviors that um, you have to learn to link together and chain together in certain ways and sometimes connect to your eyes and connect to your ears, etc. Uh, and your fingers get connected to your ears and are able to play something you hear, etc. Um, that's a complex learning process. And we know quite a bit about skill learning. We know the following things, for example, any skill, when you first start it, you almost always suck. <laughs> you almost always start at a low skill level. But you can get better. In order to get better, you need to practice. Repeated, structured practice is optimal. So, for example, you can learn basketball by playing with your buddies in the gym. That's practice, you will get better. But if you go to a formal structured training camp where they drill certain skills in a, in a very structured formal way, you will get much better faster. Okay, so the structured practice is optimal, especially if you're getting a lot of rich feedback. All right, cool. So now, if we want students to become natural critical thinkers, we have to ask them to think critically. And we have to ask them to do this over and over and over again. They need repeated practice. And preferably, we want to structure that practice and make sure they're getting a lot of feedback as they do. And that's what we got to do to teach them how to think critically. If we also want to teach them how to think creatively, how to do good oral presentations, how to listen well and learn from feedback, how to learn about themselves. You know, every skill requires the same process to develop. This is the challenge to the traditional approaches to education. They are not strong on skill development. And that's uh, where educational technologies can come into play. Why? Well, the lecture room is more of that information delivery um, situation. But there are other parts of the learning experience. For example, the assessments we use um, in as we're... Um, teaching our students. So this is the time we ask them to do stuff, right? Uh, whether it be writing an essay or literally going through a test and figuring stuff out. Well, now they're thinking critically. Uh, you know, now they're doing stuff. So in order to practice skills, we have to engage their minds. And often things like assessment context provide those active learning opportunities. Um, my favorite, in fact, is, is, is what's so-called assessment as learning, and I'll give you an example of that. But this is where the assessment is actually the learning experience. You're, you're trying to um, educate and develop the skills 
via the assessment. So students are simultaneously being assessed for, for their ability to do something, but as they do it, they're gaining the practice they need with the skills, okay? Now, these sorts of assessments, especially if we want to do them at scale, are almost always administered by technologies of some sort. Um, in fact, a lot of the active things students do in the modern educational climate have a technology component to it. Hence my argument that finding innovative educational technologies that can address the skills issue is now more critical than ever. This is a role where ed tech can really contribute heavily. Okay, so everything kind of vague so far. Let's get a little more concrete, if we may. I'm going to try to do this very efficiently, keeping time in mind. So um, when I've tried to reach this goal of skill development, it led to the creation of something called Peer Scholar. And again, mile-high view of Peer Scholar, it, it harnesses something called peer assessment. Um, and in all the study I've done, it seems to be the best ped pedagogical process for giving students repeated structured practice, the kind they need to develop these skills. It just works like this. Step one, the students are just asked to create something, you know, compose something. Uh, it could be a written activity, it could be a, them giving an oral presentation to their phone, um, any, any digital composition, but they compose something and submit it. Then they log back into the system and here's where things get interesting. They are shown the work that some of their peers submitted. In my case, it's usually six. So they see six of their peer compositions randomly selected from the class presented anonymously, and their job is to give feedback to each of these peers. And you can structure the feedback, uh, here's where the structure comes in, uh, via this form that a professor can create, but just to give you a taste, um, I like to ask students the following. Think of all the ways that peers' work could be better. Zero in on the one thing that if they fixed, that would lead to the maximum improvement. Tell them what that one thing is and tell them how to fix it. Okay, so in order to do this, peer by peer, the student has to first think critically to find that weakness. Then they have to think creatively about how it could be addressed and fixed. And then they have to communicate that all expressively to the peer. And then they have to do it again for peer two, and again for peer three, and again for peer four, all the way to peer six. Repeated structured practice engaging those skills. I should have said it this way, repeated practice, engaging those skills in a structured way, okay? Um, while they do this to six peers, six peers do it to their work. So in a third phase, they now see the feedback that students gave to their work. And once again, we ask them to analyze that feedback one at a time. Um, think about what this peer said. Uh, do you agree with it? If you change your work the way they suggested, do you think it would be better? So now the student is engaged in what we call receptive communication. They're getting information about their own work. So there's the metacognition. Um, they're getting information from a peer and we're asking them to think critically about it, think creatively about what would happen if they followed it. Okay, so once again, receptive communication, critical thinking, creative thinking, done in a structured way. They do it for the feedback from peer one, and then two, three, four, five, six, repeated structured practice, okay? So again, zooming out, um, if anybody wants obviously to learn more about Peer Scholar, please contact me. I would love to show it to you. I would love to talk to you more. But the point for the current um, uh, case is, here's a concrete example of a technology that brings students through a process, a pedagogical process, um, that's evidence-based and that is built specifically to develop skills, all right? So given everything I just told you about the current context, one would think, man, this must be an easy sell, right? There's, everybody wants skills development. Skills development are critical. It, it's hard to do in the current educational system, but here's a tool that can do it. Um, it doesn't require a lot of extra work from professors. They just create the activity and, and at the end grade the final product. It's driven by students. Students are getting this structured exercise. Wow, this must be, this must be easy. Um, this just says everything I just said. 
<laughs> so, um, yeah, you, you know, it's got a lot of characteristics that suggest that it fits very well both with the current approach to education and the challenges it faces. And so it's, it's a how. It, that's what I like to call it. It's the how to develop skills. It provides a concrete answer to that. But it's not that trivial to sell. Again, I am the salesman. And here are some of my challenges and frustrations. F number one, I just want to talk to the people who I think should want to hear about this. Um, these are people like directors of centers of teaching and learning. Um, you know, and, and let's just stop there, for example, because that would be my number one person that I really want to talk to at a campus. But it's not always so easy. They have a lot on their plate. They have you know, a lot of initiatives that have been brought down, top down, and whatnot. And, and so they do not just drop everything to listen to a vendor when a vendor contacts them. Uh, and so that's the tricky, that's one tricky thing. Now, when I do talk to them, they want to know two things. One is they want to be sure the pedagogy makes sense. We always pass that you know, uh, hands down. So people see Peer Scholar and they go, yeah, the pedagogy makes sense. But they come up with the second question. How will we get others to use it? Will others use it? Um, that's a worry of theirs. They don't want to buy into something unless it's going to be used on campus. Uh, and so that's a major, major question. One I've thought a lot about that will weave that into the talk. Um, they often also say, oh, well, we're the center of teaching and learning. We don't have a central budget for buying educational technologies. Every department buys it themselves, or every school in our campus buys it themselves, or every unit buys it, blah, 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 blah. Um, no centralized budget. So even though we like your technology and we think it will scale, you should go talk to engineering first, and then nursing, and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, and... Uh, you know, overarching all of this is that issue that professors, by and large, are not the most innovative group. <laughs> They're not the most risk-taking group. Um, they tend to be sometimes relatively minimalist in their teaching adventures. They want to find something that works and stick to it, feels comfortable. So they tend to be risk-adverse, uh, and that permeates through the whole system. And so how, you know, how can we get around these challenges? So there are challenges. And these are the ones that have motivated me to think about how I think the ecosystem should be. If, if we really want things to hum, if we want the kind of efficiency that the campus consortium is trying to provide, um, which I think maybe, yeah, I'll show you in a second. Um, how can we do that? So I'll, I'll come back to that. Well, here, here are the things. This isn't a mystery novel. Um, so I'm going to just kind of lay out um, the, the main points uh, as we go through, and I'll re-emphasize these again at the end. But I'm going to suggest that we have to have, do a better job of having the right people in institutions and ed tech uh, vendors connecting. I'm going to suggest we have to revisit our, our procurement process uh, to both centralize it, point three, and make it focused on pedagogy, um, our real mission. Uh, we need to see vendors as partners in our mission, and we need to expect them to be partners. Um, and I, I also have this notion of what I'll call the scaling phase in terms of how we structure our deals with vendors. Uh, and so I will highlight that uh, as well. Okay, so let's go through some of these. Here's the first one, and then let me break it down to the bottom right-hand corner. Um, this is a sick person sneezing in front of us. You know the reaction you have to a sick person that's sneezing right in front of you? You know, ugh, get away from me. Yeah. Um, that is the reaction I feel when people think I am going to try to pitch an ed tech to them. Um, you know, CTL type. So if I'm at a conference or something like that, and they're like, oh, there's that Jordan, watch out for him, he's got stake in an ed tech, uh, then, <laughs> then there's this sort of reaction. And I, I understand where some of these things stem from. And, and let me speak to come a couple of these um, kind of quickly. So, you know, we all like this idea of open educational resources, sharing, educators who care should just share their stuff. Um, and I agree with that sentiment to an extent. 
Um, if this is something that somebody has created, if they, if they were able to create something without too, too much work, especially if they're already paid educators, um, you know, who that's their job, um, and, and if sharing does not require them to do a whole lot extra to whatever they're sharing, if it's literally just, here you go, uh, then yeah, I really like those, those open educational resources too, and I, and I am a firm believer in it. But when it comes to ed tech, that is meant to, to really be a serious solution to difficult challenges. EdTech where you need a team of people uh, to build it, to support it, uh, to continue to evolve it, to interact with customers in an efficient way, to keep the business underlying it all healthy enough so that the EdTech can continue to grow and evolve. Well, now there's a bunch of people that need to be paid, that deserve to be paid. You know, we all get paid for our teaching. And so we should certainly expect our coders to get paid for their coding and our customer interaction people to get paid for their customer interactions. Uh, and so, you know, I, I've really come to the, the very clear opinion that the university has to in, uh, embrace the idea that if you want good tools to support the educational games, you should expect to pay for them. And this shouldn't be a horrible thing. So the people who are offering you these tools should not be should not be you know viewed in this sort of negative way. They should be seen as partners who have potentially something great to offer, and they should be listened to. And to the extent they do have something good to offer, they should be worked with in a partnership kind of way. So more specifically, I think we need to all do a better job of connecting those people who are on our campus and who are in charge of, of coming up with innovative ways to educate with those companies who are trying to provide tools that support innovative ways to educate. Um, so literally we can do this at an institution by institution way. So there should be, in my opinion, every institution should have some sort of website or something that says, hey, you think you got a great ed tech and, and you'd like to demo it for us? Fill out this form. Um, here are the things that are important to us, and if that ed tech you know, fits certain criteria, then somebody should be ready to listen carefully um, and assess that ed tech. And so that it should be invited, you know, those sorts of in interactions should be invited. And in fact, we could use other vehicles. So as one example, uh, I am now one of the consultants of a platform called One HE. It's, it's sort of like a LinkedIn kind of platform, but it's more for higher educators. Uh, and, and it's really globally focused to, to enhance education in a global way. Very social responsible group of people. I quite like them. Um, we had a discussion about including a page there which is a page where ed tech vendors could, could post pitches um, describing their products and educators could then discuss and riff off them. So literally a place where educators could go to kind of see what's going on. I'm a guitar player. There's, there's something called NAM where people flock to every year to see the latest guitar technologies, the latest tools they might bring into their repertoire. We should have that same thing on websites and, and, and we should carry that same mentality into our institutions. Um, so this will be a vibe that goes through, but this is lesson one. You know, let's, let's bring vendors and, and, and decision makers on campus together in a more respectful, interactive way. Um, now, procurement. When we're actually thinking about this, when we're interacting with a vendor, and thinking, do we want to bring this to our campus? Well, I think we need to alter that. The way I see it, at least a very common current approach, and one that I've been pushed towards sometimes as a vendor, is the following. Um, we're told, well, we only buy a technology if enough individual professors ask us to buy it, basically. So they say, go to the individual professors. Convince them the technology is good. If you can convince a bunch of them to try it, and if they like it, and if they like it enough to come to us to say, hey, we should have this on our campus, that's how we do things around here, okay? Um, and I'm gonna tell you some of the problems with, with that approach, but let's just leave that and just say, you know, is, is that how things happen on your campus? Um, here's what I'm going to suggest. Um, there's problems with that. And here's the U of T context. So first of all, our, our, our LMS is Canvas. And of course, with the LMS, we have a much more formal approach to deciding what LMS we're going to use. But our second most, the only other, in fact, I think, institutionally supported 
educational technology on our campus is Turnitin. Uh, why do we put a lot of money into Turnitin? Well, because of what's on the left. A bunch of professors liked it. They liked being able to catch their students plagiarizing. Um, and so they said, hey, we want this. Um, but what's the message that's sent? So, so U, U of T spends a lot of money to have access to turn it in. Um, and the idea here is, hey, we value, well, you know, you could, you could say academic integrity, uh, which, is, which is fair enough. Or the, we want our students to be able to cite work well. We want them to know they have to cite work appropriately. All fantastic. Is that really, you know, if you, if you imagine the, the things we hope our students leave our institution with, the skills, the whatever, how high does that rate? Does it rate high enough to be the next thing we purchase after our LMS? I think not, quite honestly. Um, Sorry, turn it in. I'm not, not trying to pick on turn it in, but I think I think this is symptomatic of a bad approach to procurement, um, one that isn't focused properly. When we're when we're thinking about educational technologies, of course, there's a bunch of things we have to worry about. Is it secure? Is the price reasonable? Will professors use it? Is it accessible? Is it sufficiently supported? Does the pedagogy align with our mission? Is it inclusive? Does it provide a nice, fair, inclusive experience for all students? These are all fantastic questions. The point I wanna make is, what's the most important? If we were going to order these from you know, most important to least, well, okay, we may say things like security is number one because we have to protect privacy, you know, there's legal. So, so there's legal issues that might push some of these high on the list. But legal issues aside, if I had to pick one of these, it would not be, will professors use it? It's an important issue. I'm going to come back to it. But that would not be what drives my purchase. What drives my purchase would be, does the pedagogy align with our mission? I think we need to start there, okay? And have a much more top-down, success-focused procurement. So, for example, at the University of Toronto, um, right now, it says the university will strive to ensure that its graduates are educated in the broadest sense of the term, with the ability to think clearly, judge objectively, and contribute constructively to society. This sounds like skills, right? Um, it's, it's not, in fact, worded as well as I would like. I, would li I'd li I think we should revise this a little bit um, to be a little bit more explicitly, but, but uh, a little more explicitly, a little more explicit. But, um, you know, we have, we all have a sort of mission statement. And in my opinion, when we're considering an educational technology, there should be two questions at the top of our minds. And in fact, posed to our vendor. How will adopting your technology help us better achieve our mission. Specifically, how is your technology going to enhance the success of our students? And if success means their ability to develop these skills, these transferable skills, um, how does it do that? Now, there are other forms of success you could potentially have out there, but again, this, this notion would, would apply. I want the vendor to explicitly tell me how they will reach that mission and do you have any evidence to support your claims? We're, we're in the academy. We should care about data. We should care about evidence. And we do, obviously. And so, you know, sometimes somebody could prevent a, a technology that just sort of prima facie, when you think about it, you go, oh yeah, 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 that would do those things. Yeah. So sometimes you can accept it, face value, um, but we would really like to see some data. We'd really like to see some of that efficacy and usability kind of stuff I talked about my lab doing, right? Um, so. These should be the questions. How are you going to help me do, do what we want to do? And, and do you have any reason for me to really believe that, that you can? Now, what's this going to do to the vendors? It's going to tell them that our universities are focused on pedagogy. And when they develop their tools and pitch their tools, they better have pedagogy at the top of their list as well. A lot of educational technology companies don't even include an educational expert. On, on their core you know, group of people. Often it's somebody who had an idea and um, an engineer who is able to build that idea. If we say pedagogy comes first, then it has to come first for them too. Um, they will mirror 
our priorities. Uh, and what that means is that we would have more pedagogical expertise involved in the actual creation of these innovations, which is great for the ecosystem you know, all around. All right. Here's the campus consortium thing here. Reduce time, cost, and effort associated. I wanted to bring this back because I want to bring it back in a different case. I want to contrast three companies here. And these are um, companies, by the way, Pearson is my, the textbook that I use. I also use the Top Hat Response System. Cognito is the company behind Peer Scholar. Um, so these are three companies I know fairly well, interact with all, and, and I use their products. So this is not a slam, but I want to contrast them in an important way. If you think of the size of these companies, Pearson's the biggest, Top Hat in the middle, we're the, we're the, the small, I'm going to use the term light company. And I use that term in the following way. The Pearson approach to things is to have individual representatives knocking on doors, knocking on individual faculty members' doors. That costs a lot of money. Um, who pays for that? Well, the person that buys the product pays for that. Right, it, and so it, 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 if you want this company to be a very large, well, I'll call a heavy company, if those are the you know sort of companies you want to interact with, well, you better be ready to pay a lot for your product. Top Hat is sort of a middle-sized company, and so part of their competitive advantage is that they're not as big. They don't have a whole world of reps traveling all over the country, but they have them calling you on the phone. Right? They have a little office full of people who are doing cold calls to professors and doing all this outreach, um, and that costs a lot of money as well. And that all goes into the product. What do we do? We're a lot smaller, and our hope is that we talk to one to five people on each campus, the people involved in enhancing teaching and learning at the campus. So we want a much more central kind of approach uh, and we want that for a number of reasons that I'm going to highlight in the next little section. Um, it allows us to be efficient. It allows us to not have to have a huge staff of people just doing outreach and connection. And the result of that is that we can offer a lower priced product. Um, and so let's keep this in mind. Light versus heavy companies as we think about a few other things. So. Here's the next point I want to highlight. How central is our procurement? So we're still on procurement here. Um, a lot of places are decentralized, silos, however you want to call it. And so I will call some of these universities and they'll say, oh yeah, that sounds really cool, that's really interesting. Um, now you have to go start talking to every individual department because we don't have any centralized approach to purchasing. Um, I think this is just not good. It can result in, in a duplication of relationships with vendors. So you have vendors selling the same product to multiple different people, sometimes for full use, full institutional use, but because nobody else knows, then, then you can have multiple places on a campus. You can also have multiple versions of, like say, a peer assessment technology. You can have different parts of your campus using different peer assessment technologies. So you get this you know, shotgun kind of approach to who's using what, where, and why. Um, with a why, yeah, each group is deciding what to use in their own way. So you don't have a systematic or rational approach to procurement like I was preaching earlier. You don't tend to have central support. Um, you know, normally the center of teaching and learning in a centralized situation would support the technologies they, they buy into. But now if everybody's buying into their own, then where do you go if you need support for X, Y, or Z? And so it ends up being a very um, inelegant um, un unlike the word seamless, seamy, that's a seamy kind of way of doing things. And it also requires third party vendors to employ more sales and outreach staff. The reason Pearson does it the way they do, the reason Top Hat does it the way they do, is because they've been convinced that they have to go to the professors. Remember that thing, get a few professors to use it first and then come see me? Well, that means you have to do outreach on a professor level. Uh, and that requires a big staff, more money, and it all just inflates the cost of the technology, which makes it less likely that it's going to be used. Uh, so obviously, I'm in favor of a more centralized. It gets rid of the duplication. 
Um, and so that reduces potential cost, especially by the way, if you're using it on a wider scale, you can often get it for cheaper for that. Um, so it makes sense in, in that sense too. It's easier to support because you can do so centrally. Um, so you can support a rational approach to procurement. You can also support it um, centrally. You can have websites devoted to it that contain you know, all the information a person could need to use the product well. You can have the institutional IT support team um, there to help people out. Uh, just makes so much more sense. And it also allows the ed tech companies to be lighter. That does two things. It, it means that yes, the price should be lower and is, but it also means you're allowing a different kind of company to play. Um, you're allowing the more, more of the startup crowd and that tends to be where the innovation is. So if you really want innovative solutions, then you need to allow these lighter companies to play and you will be rewarded if you do. Uh, and so I'm a big fan of let's get our budget centralized, let's get our procurement centralized, let's get our support centralized, and then we can really work well. We can really make all the efficiencies hum. Okay. And a last point to this, to kind of tie that together. How does the business model usually work? Well, in most cases, you know, we're linked to what we're saying. It's kind of like, well, okay, we have a bunch of professors who've tried it and liked it. And so because you got enough, now let's talk about full unlimited institutional use, you know, based on some unit cost related to total enrollment. So it's $3 per student enrolled or $5 per student enrolled or $1 per student enrolled. So you go straight from a few professors to a full institutional license. Um, it's kind of like you know going from a, a, a few words with, a, with, with somebody you might like to date to marriage. Uh, I think there should be more of a courting period. And I think the courting period is critical to getting to know one another and getting to work with one another. So I'm also going to argue that once you've identified a vendor um, that has a product that will help you reach your goals uh, and you know, that, that, that kind of fits with everything that we've talked about so far. Now, when you get to the point of a deal, here's what I consider the best approach. That first, you should insist on a low cost, unlimited use pilot for, for a year. First year, let's agree on some cost. Um, it's gonna be relatively low because we have no idea what usage is going to be yet. So we're gonna start as an introductory cost, but then together, we will really try to internally promote it, internally support it, and do what we can to increase usage. Um, this is fair to me, the institution, because the risk is relatively low. I don't know if people are going to use this, and I don't wanna pay for something people aren't going to use. So, so now I get to start relatively low, um, and now I want to try to see if I can boost usage, but so too does the ed tech company. Because if you say starting year two, we will pay based on actual usage. And we will continue year after year to pay based on usage until we reach some level where we can start talking about marriage. <laughs> okay, but we're not there yet. We're going to go from, oh, it's used in four classes to let's see if we can get it used in eight. Let's see if we can use, get it used in 20. Let's see, et cetera. And now both entities have a reason to be working together to enhance usage on the campus. Again, there's that partnership I wanna describe, and I'm gonna get back to that. So I think this middle phase can be critical to that. And then you know the prize is, and you can negotiate this right from the, from the get-go, you can say once usage hits a certain level, then we'll go to full institutional and it'll look like the following, okay? But that's a ceiling of my cost and let's get there slowly by working together with a common goal of getting to that usage number, all right? So I think this is the sort of deal people should like. Um, and then when that deal is in place, there should be expectations the vendor should not simply provide the technology. They should provide resource. Remember, we put pedagogy up front, right? We said, sell us something that's gonna help us reach our pedagogical goals. 
So the vendor should be providing web content that, that helps users use it, enhance that usability, webinars to show how it can be used effectively, that's supposed to say use cases, you know, promote certain ways that it is being used to reach certain goals, provide promotional materials, maybe give targeted webinars on a campus, maybe physically go to the campus and, and give a talk at the Center of Teaching and Learning. Do these kinds of things um, and, and share them all with the university so that the university can also use these, these resources for internal marketing. And together, you guys work together to increase the, the um, number of users and to support the community. Uh, I also think the vendor should provide a very up-to-date and very powerful train-the-trainer experience. Universities already have a strong uh, support IT group that, that are there to help faculty learn about technologies that might suit their, their challenges and use those technologies. So the vendor should be training these IT people. They, in a sense, become a bridge um, between the institution and the vendor. Uh, they are the internal marketing team for the institution, but they're also an extension of the vendor. They, they connect the vendor to the end users. And so I think that relationship should be one that the vendor has to take very seriously. And I also think during procurement, you should be obviously asking about those. Um, and you should also insist that the vendor have some way of letting you track usage. Um, so that together you can see how progress is going, you should be checking in regularly, you should be talking about what you can do to increase. Again, all of this echoes back with that respectful partners in success, right? Which is really what I think the ecosystem needs. All right. So here are the, my main points said in a different way than the previous ones, but respect the important role vendors play, adopt a centralized approach to adoption, focus adoption on meeting our mission to students, allow the smaller vendors to be in the game, thereby reducing cost and supporting innovation, structure the deal in a way that motivates a partnership relationship, expect your vendor to help you reach your goals. They're part of that growth process and commit to do your part also in that year or two through your internal promotions and internal support so that you're doing your part of the partnership. I think if we get these pieces in play, then we can get the lowest cost, most powerful, relevant and appropriate technologies in our campus, technologies that help our students be ready for their life, both career and real life uh, after they leave our institutions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that very much. Went a little longer than I thought right now, 52 minutes. I'm going to have to search for some efficiencies. Uh, but there we are. There's my uh, email if you'd like to reach out. You can also connect via LinkedIn. Or I strongly encourage you, by the way, to check out 1HE. Um, I quite like them. They're very cool folks. If you're interested in Peer Scholar at all, send an email to info at peerscholar.com. Uh, otherwise, this is QA period, so let's rock. <laughs>